Being a hardcore gamer for many includes celebrating the history of the medium. Whether you are there or not, it's important to recognise where gaming has been to understand where it is and by extension where it's going. Now let's not get too far ahead of ourselves, this list does not exist to express that gaming used to be better in any particular era. There are positives and negatives to every decade and for all of the sentimental warmth that parts of this might elicit, we must not forget that it's important that things always move forward. After all, stagnation sounds like a gross word on purpose. With that being said, I'm CypherWhatCulture.com and these are 10 video game traditions that are dead and buried. Number 10. Cheat Codes whether it's the Konami code you know, or Grand Theft Auto Vice City's health, armour and money cheats, button inputs that hide boons were a part of video games for a long time. In the earlier days, it was the main way for developers to hide things in their game, be that easter eggs, secrets, or just a way for the player to be a big dirty cheater. Level select, infinite lives, and who could forget the classic itself, Big Head Mode. It was an omen of what's to come when GTA 4 changed its cheats from strings of muscle memory button taps to memorising phone numbers. Still, it sometimes feels like GTA is one of the only franchises to still bake in cheats. Before the existence of online multiplayer giving games a theoretically unending life, cheats were the ideal way for players to fall around with a game they had mastered and have a new experience. For others, it was a way to, well, cheat to overcome hardships and see the rest of the game before YouTube was the answer. No, the early days of gaming internet were held up by pillars like Super Cheats, Cheat CC, and Cheat Planet. And before that, the magazine free gift of the sacred text that was the cheat book. Praise be to these collection of codes that brought much joy and infinite ammo carnage. Number 9. Gaming Magazines for Major Reveals during the 90s, it was a surefire sign that you were serious about video games if, when you weren't playing them, you were reading about them. Monthly magazines were, for the most part, our only access to news, previews and reviews. This was the place you came to find out whether Spyro the Dragon was getting a sequel, or how the Sega Dreamcast was going to change the industry forever. For the people that worked on these many magazines, be they officially licensed publications or third party, they were pioneers and lived in a totally different world to the press of today. Given a month to create a magazine, and make it the best it could be, rather than be able to react to breaking news like today. Content, placement, real estate on the page and visual design were everything. These weren't the daily papers, these were, at the best of times, their own source of entertainment. In fact, that was one reason to buy and keep games mags, the wealth of brilliant and memorable covers and advertising that only occurred within these pages. Gaming magazines aren't completely gone, with respected brands like Edge and PC Gamer continuing to carry the flag. However, these quite rightfully now gear more towards collectors and nostalgia rather than try to compete with the information supergiants that is the World Wide Web. Number 8. Demos for Every Big Game before the internet, there was much greater separation between press and pundit. Those lucky buggers working for the magazines often got the chance to get early looks and hands-on with games as a way to inform the audience and, if the developer did their work right, sell them on that upcoming smash hit from some guy called Hideo Kojima or something. Never heard of him. But there was a way for gamers to try a title themselves, and that was the hallowed demo. Most famously, perhaps, demo discs that adorned the front of your favourite gaming mag, assuming some cretin hadn't come into the store and torn it off. These days, demos are nowhere near as common. There are many potential reasons for this, including companies wanting consumers to commit to buy rather than try first, and in extreme cases, accidents where demos have been easily exploited by gamers. Infamously, Crash Bash's demo was the full title with most of the game's content locked off until fans removed the locks. At least these days, audiences have much greater access to deals and discounts on online storefronts to make an impromptu purchase. And of course, there's Game Pass. If you want to rekindle that authentic demo disc feeling, we recommend downloading a dozen random titles and playing them for a maximum of 20 minutes. Ah, nostalgic. Number 7. Rentals there was one other way to try games before you bought them, and in this particular instance it was the full product rather than a vertical slice. Get those tissues ready and prepare to press F to mourn the passing of blockbuster video. It cannot be overstated how much a part of Western culture rentals became. In 1998 in particular, the rental industry in America made more money than the cinema box office by over $4.5 million. Video games were just a portion of that pie, but it was quite the divisive subject. Nintendo in particular were concerned about the the effect it could have on their profit margins and spent years chasing Blockbuster with court orders that ultimately went nowhere. Rentals were a chance to play the newest titles, often on release day, for a fraction of the price. For gamers that only got new titles on special occasions like birthdays and holidays, it was suddenly possible to have a taste of every possibility. 
As a general concept, rentals have become a thing of the past due to the rise in streaming and digital distribution. Before this though, it was the Friday night excursion to the brick and mortar store, whether that was Blockbuster or an independent, to pick up a film for the night and, if you were lucky, scope out those latest Mega Drive releases. Number 6. Cheat Cartridges Cheat codes implanted into the game made you feel like a sneaky player until, of course, you stumbled upon the existence of cheat cartridges. If you didn't own one, you'll have strong memories of looking for the aforementioned cheat codes and instead finding long, confusing strings of digits for cheat cartridges that could do stuff you could only dream about. Forget giving yourself infinite health and ammo, the real devious power of cheats was tearing the game apart, making it possible to change character models, spawn items, or perhaps most infamously walk through walls to leave the confines of the title behind. These unlicensed pieces of kits went into your console's cartridge slot or disc tray like any other game, but allowed the next title inserted to be blown wide open. There were plenty of them, all with different names, with Game Genie, Game Shark and Action Replay being the most prominent. With consoles being easier to crack and harder for companies to update once they were out into the world, these cheat cartridges were pretty impossible to stop when they were in circulation. And to be fair, they didn't really harm the companies, it's not like the famous R4 cart for the Nintendo DS which could be filled with ROMs. These were merely code-breaking cheats and ways for players to turn a game into their own playground. Number 5. Chipped Consoles Hearing your friend had the new Final Fantasy you'd both seen in the magazines was exciting. Hearing that he'd gotten a hold of an American copy a few months early was something else entirely. Chipped consoles had numerous uses and were controversial from the get-go. Playing games from other regions was massive, especially in the UK, where players would often wait six months or more for a game to arrive. There was also the ability to play copied versions of titles, avoiding the RRP completely and opening players up to a library of illegally sourced games. Clearly, this was the most alarming thing, as this relatively easy tweak to most consoles of the 1990s was eating into potential profits. Considering modding was as simple as removing a protection chip in most cases, industry heads could do very little except warn that the practice was potentially damaging to your hardware. The practice kept going for many console generations, morphing over time with three loader discs and homebrew software even into the early days of the Nintendo Wii. Once more, it was the reliance of the internet that brought the change. With consoles being connected 24-7, it meant that fixes to these mods could be rolled out very quickly. Number 4. Instruction Manuals Instruction booklets for many games were merely as the name suggests, an image of the button layout and a few tips and tricks on how the game works. However, more and more games used them as a place to create something beautiful and memorable, showcasing high quality artwork and drawing you into the world. In a time before the cutscene, the manual was usually the place to go to give context to the game's story and they could tease you with what's to come. Whether you are reading it in anticipation of playing a game for the first time or diving in to satiate your desire for more content, instruction booklets were a part of the game you could hold in your hands and pore over for hours. This one, in all fairness, has a good reason for dying out, and a lack of manuals with games is definitely better for the environment. Additionally, perhaps more importantly for the conglomerates behind them, it's simply cheaper not to produce them. It's certainly not something that we need back by any stretch of the imagination. Like most of the things on this list, it's merely a representation in the change of priorities and tastes in gaming. As the industry pulls ever closer to digital releases over physical ones, things like instruction booklets simply have no place. Number 3. Weird Controllers and Peripherals The silhouette of the N64 controller is instantly recognisable, but even if you love it, you at least understand why it wasn't ever really imitated. These days, even Nintendo, who continue to experiment in this regard, put out pro controllers which fall completely in line with the core design philosophies of their contemporaries. But in yesteryears, controllers were weird and exceedingly varied. Not just your boxed-in pads either, there was a wealth of other options out there. Novelty ways to play found themselves lifted out of the arcade and adapted for home use. Light guns, steering wheels and arcade fight sticks. While some of these still exist, they are far less prominent. In the case of light guns, the genre of on-rail shooters has waned without them. The same can be said about rhythm games. The last big gasp of weird peripherals were the plastic guitars, drums and the still confounding DJ desk. Whilst immersive and enjoyable, proven by their success, they had a very clear expiry date from the start. No one was buying another set if theirs didn't connect to the next console generation. In an era where developers and fans are both seemingly keen to put every title into neat boxes, the idea of purchasing unique peripherals for a particular genre, or even a single game, seems fairly low. Better for your wallet, yes, but these peripherals have perhaps more charm than ever considering how standardised gaming controllers have become. Number 2. Unlockables 
Downloadable content began in gaming as a way to keep games alive post-launch. The title was finished, but fans were still hungry for more and it was a good way to tap into an existing audience. Then, over time, it became common for additional content to launch immediately alongside the game, which posed the question, if it comes out at the same time as the game, why isn't it in the game that I bought? And that's before getting into the murky waters of essentially paying for a key that unlocks content on a disc. With a lack of possibility for post-launch support, video games shipped as complete packages. As such, every mode, every skin, every character, every bonus level, and so on could be earned. If a designer finished it, it was on the disc somewhere, and to squeeze out every last drop of experience was all about skill, perseverance, and video game mastery. It was the true incentive for 100%ing a title, seeing what unlockables games had to offer. These days, rewards often get no more complex than the prompt that you've earned a digital trophy. DLC as a concept is great because it's at a player's discretion. Not interested in a particular character or a weapon skin? That's fine, you don't have to buy it. However, most players would care a lot more about anything at all if they earned it themselves through the act of playing, rather than just dropping cash. Number 1. Video games finished at launch it seems like a bit of a cheap shot, but there's no more important subject to end on that the biggest games used to launch as total packages. Now, studios are so married to release windows that they'll shuffle games out of the door as unoptimized messes, and gamers will sink hard-earned cash on the title, despite the fact that they may need to wait weeks or months until it's in its best state. This one goes out to the games industry because, as frustrating as it can be for consumers, the behind-the-scenes situation is even tougher. Previously, you'd hear all about rap parties for games, with developers celebrating their hard work work going to print. These days it seems that there's no time to celebrate as most teams work is never done. With home consoles catching up to PC gaming in terms of being in an always online state, almost all publishers lean on the fact they can launch patches to fix anything that didn't get done during the hellacious crunch. Whilst these started small with merely kilobyte updates, now games have patches within their first weeks of double-figure gigabytes, perhaps multiple times. When a game goes green, the studio don't relax. Developers don't pause, they merely get to work on the next round of bug fixes and updates. The game on the disc might be done, but it's not actually finished. And that's the list. Let us know what you thought of this video down in the comments below. Are there any of these that you're particularly nostalgic about? Everyone has a story about demo discs, right? Well, I want to read them. So get down into those comments. And of course, make sure you like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe and hit that notification bell. I've been Cypher Culture, and have a good week.